Okay, well, welcome, folks. Um, my name is Peter, and I'll, I'll be doing the first half of this uh, session. Don't quite know how long this will take, actually, but it was uh, intended to give those of you who had no experience of this machine an overview of, of what the Lorenz machine is all about, some very, very uh, quick statistics about it, but then to look in at a pretty, pretty high level uh, at um, the activities that led to us being able to more or less routinely read Lorenz traffic. Um, however, I will say some words about the attrition rate, which was actually quite high. But there is an optimistic end to this. OK, so the agenda this evening is uh, what happened to Colossus after the war. Um, we know, and it's documented now in the book by uh, Ferris, a uh, yes, yes, Canadian, yes, um, I'm echoing here, a Canadian um, Academic. published in 2020 that uh, four Robinsons from two Colossi were um, preserved post-war. Uh, so they survived the uh, instruction coming down from Churchill to dismantle all the uh, working machines, the 10 working machines at Bletchley. Um, and he says they were reconfigured along the best tabulators to order to tax Soviet teleprinter traffic. Well, that's uh, given that this is the uh, official... Uh, biography, if you like, of GCHQ. That's quite um, quite an exposing statement there. So I don't think it's published anywhere else anyway. It's been long our mm -hmm. assumption yeah. that why would you keep uh, 10 machines back for the best part of 15 years and more after the war had finished if it wasn't to uh, give you some sort of assistance during the Cold War period. So um, this, this does tend to underline that um, that assumption. So I'll be looking at the mm -hmm. basics of uh, Lorentz SZ40 and 42 models. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, I'll take a quick look at Bill Tut's 1 plus 2, uh, sometimes known as double delta algorithm, very high level. Um, and also I'll touch on a little bit about basic linguistics, and in particular that of German language and how that plays into this process. What I'll say about this is um, there's also there's quite a lot been written uh, both by uh, uh, Jack Copeland and um, Paul Gannon um or, or assembled information and there's there's a lot of different um angles on this and what i'll be taking is my own personal angle through this so this is a in some 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 of it will be distillation of of um information you may have already heard um others may be assumptions that i've made that i think are reasonable but feel free to challenge them um but what i've basically my um drive for this this is a complicated story. In the museum, we try to explain it to all levels of ability. Um, so for that reason, I mean, I'm not a math mathematician by any means. I'm certainly not a linguist. Um, I failed my first year of mathematics at, at college. I had to retake it. Um, so this is my take on it. And this tries to make it, I'm trying to make it understandable for um, a whole wide range of people. So um, if it's too simple for you, then Please bear with me. If it's not, then uh, great. I've probably hit the target. OK, so Jerry will then take over um, and answer the question really that drives all this. Um, does it work on other languages? And so I'll leave him to uh, to expose that. I think you'd probably second guess the answer to that already, actually. But otherwise, we wouldn't be here. OK, so <clears throat> let's have a look at machine in question. This is actually a, a picture of the... Uh, SZ42 that's in the museum, in the TNMOC Museum, in the Tunney Gallery. And a um, very quick look at it reveals it's got 12 wheels in it. It's got an on-off switch down the bottom here. Uh, we'll take a close-up look at this. It's basically teleprinter gubbins at the top here. Um, this is a serial data transmission tool, so it receives data from a keyboard, keyboard over on the right here. Um, also manufactured um, by the Lorenz Company in Berlin. And this, um, I think I'm writing saying, is actually a licensed copy of an American design, which is probably attributable to what became the Teletype Corporation. So uh, it looks very much like a Model 12P, I think, if, from memory. Um, but it's manufactured in, in Berlin by, uh, by Lorenz. It produces, <clears throat> for every key press, a 5-bit data pattern, um, often mistakenly called the Bordeaux code. It's the Murray code, really. It's a five-bit code for sure, or a five-element code, as, in fact, Emil Bordeaux's original was. Um, and it's a development of it, and it's actually standardised as uh, the International Telegraphy Alphabet number two. 
for what that's worth. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So a five-bit code, serial code, is produced by the keyboard, and it clocks out into this machine, into the SZ40 or 42, um, and it's then encrypted, apply an additive ciphering mechanism or a stream ciphering mechanism, however you'd like to call it. Uh, the addition's done modulo two, which makes it re um, reversible simply by repeated uh, action. In other words, this generates a cryptographic key, which is added letter by letter to the plain text. That produces your ciphertext. Cypher the ciphertext is reversed into plain text simply by adding in sequence the same key that encrypted it, um, which is neat and is not new even in 1940 because it was patented in 1917 uh, by Bell Laboratories. So um, this is not new technology, although it does manifest as new technology for those of you who are active on WhatsApp and end-to-end -end encryption, essentially a stream cipher and the key material is being added in a very similar fashion. So it's quite funny to wind the kids up at the museum and say, do you realize you're using technology inside your device that, that has its origins over a hundred years ago? It's quite an eye opener. Um, <clears throat> of course, as with all these uh, cipher systems, certainly a symmetric system like this, uh, the challenge is one of key exchange. So how do I share the key with the uh, uh, receiver um, and still keep the whole transmission system uh, secure? It's done by not sharing the key directly, but you share a pointer to the key, and that's using uh, some form of message, message indicator. Closer look at the uh, 12 rotors now. Each rotor has different number of starting positions on it, uh, the so-called wheel settings. And you'll notice they're numbered down the bottom there, 43 at one end, down to 23 at the other. The maximum is 61, the smallest is 23. Um, and you'll notice there's a proliferation of prime numbers in there. Prime numbers feature very um, frequently in, in cryptographic uh, circles. Uh, so you won't be surprised to know that these are all primes and relative primes. The reason we've got to up to relative primes in there, of course, is because there are only 10 prime numbers between 61 and 23. So we have to use something that's going to behave just like prime number, but is in fact not a prime number. That's 51 and 26 down here is K4, K4 wheel. <clears throat> so... The reason I'm banging on about that is um, we don't want the key to repeat for as long as possible. And one of the features about prime numbers or an attribute of prime numbers is their lowest common multiple is their product, um, as is the same with relative primes. So if I make sure these are all prime and relative, then I can be assured that key will not repeat for as long as it possibly can go. Uh, so it needs to be longer than ideally than the message because I don't want it to repeat. If I repeat a key on a, on a message, um, then I've failed, um, arguably failed one of the rules of cryptography that's best avoided, and that is to reuse a key for two different messages. Sometimes you get away with it, sometimes you don't. Um, but it's good practice to do. I'll, I'll try to avoid reusing a cryptographic key if you possibly can. Uh, this does it mathematically by making sure these numbers, when you multiply together, they give quite a large number out. Um, okay, so a close up of the uh, a pair of the wheels here, for example, shows their structure. You've got a thumb wheel down this side here for setting it, a number ring, which has the numbers according to the uh, number of positions on that wheel and the, st the start positions on that wheel. Um, and this number is the initial start position that's visible through the window when the lid on the front of the machine is down and it's locked. You can see the lid. So all you can do with the machine is just change the thumb wheel positions to, to modify the start positions. Um, to the left of those down in this particular example, we've got a row of sometimes called pins. I prefer to call them tabs, I suppose. But uh, you notice that some are in the central position, some are across to the left. Um, so we've got an active position and an inactive position. Uh, and this is quite simply opening and closing a switch. A switch is right at the bottom of the travel. You can't see it. Uh, on the machine itself, it's out of sight, um, but it's opening and closing and, produ and, and producing a bit pattern of ones and zeros or dots and crosses as the uh, actually people would have them, um, or impulses, non-impulses, signal elements, call them what you will. It's a, it's a binary sequence as those wheels rotate. So it's quite simple. Um, so let's have a look at the numbers theoretically. Um, I mentioned those um, starting positions, the product of all the start positions on all 12 wheels. 
if you multiply them together, you get 16 million, million, million possible start positions. Um, so that's the longest possible message you could encrypt. If it was smaller than that, considerably smaller than that, maybe let's say down in the realms of um, of Enigma, a three word Enigma, about 16,900 or so start positions, the, the, once you've exceeded, say, 17,000 characters, the key is starting to repeat. We do want, not want the key to repeat. Um, if it repeats and it's encrypting different plain text material, then it's called a cryptographic depth. And that's routinely read by a competent cryptanalyst. So best avoided. Looking at the CAMs, there are the same number of CAMs or pins um, or tabs on each of the wheels as there are start positions. And so if we add those up, we get 501. So therefore, in theory, there are two to the power 501 combinations of those. And if you multiply those two big numbers together, you get a total complexity, theoretically, of this machine. Uh, it's the number of message settings you could choose on any given message of around 10 to the power of 170. Now, Sheridan, um, uh, who's on the call, I think, uh, who's our resident astronomer, assures me that he's counted all the atoms in the universe. And this is approximately the number of atoms in the universe squared. So that's quite a large number. And you can kind of see why the people buying into this machine are quite confident that nobody's going to break it. Okay, so that's so here's how we share wheel settings. Um, this is a fateful message indicator. And it's typical. It is supposed to be a random sequence of 12 letters. Um, and each of those letter positions corresponds to a wheel position. And I actually number from left to right. So Wheel one on the left-hand side of the machine is H, and wheel 12 on the right-hand side is G. Um, from enough of these messages, we can tell that this right-hand position only takes 23 letters of the alphabet. So there's some restriction based around 23. So you can assume perhaps there are 23 starting positions on that wheel. So we know a little bit about this machine already. Um, also, by observation, we find that only 25 letters are used, no J. Um, there may be a logical reason for that, but it doesn't really matter. So these are two numbers we know about this machine. We know it's got 12 wheels in it because the message indicator is always 12. We know that one of the wheels has probably got starting position, uh, 20, 23 starting positions and um, 25 letters in use. Okay. Um, so this is how the key settings are shared effectively. Now, if we see these key settings used for two different messages, we're probably onto a good thing as cryptanalysts because it looks as though uh, the same key settings are going to be used for two different messages. And I would call that a fatal cryptographic error. Um, and that renders your um, your message insecure. And we know that in fact happened um, on the 30th of August, 1941, this, this message setting was used and a fairly long message was hand keyed. It was about 4,000 characters long. And a, re a retransmission was requested. This was from between Vienna and Athens. A retransmission was requested. It seems a bit unfair on the operator in Vienna's point of view because it, we, an assumption, and I think it's a reasonable assumption, is the poor guy was hand typing this out and the chap at the receiving end simply wasn't watching what was coming out of his machine. And if so, if he had been, he might have noticed he'd gone garbled at some point. Um, but the message was allowed to be transmitted in its entirety and only then... Um, did our friend in the receiving end come on and uh, say, well, it looks like something's gone wrong. Can you resend it? Um, now, that's a lot of work typing a message of that length out. And so not surprisingly, human nature takes over. And the same mes message settings are, are used, are suggested by uh, the operator in Vienna. Uh, they both agree that it's going to save some time, clearly. Um, and even though they've violated the uh, uh, standing orders not to reuse key settings. Um, to add insult to injury, the operator in Vienna has saved a bit more time, uh, shortened some of the words in there, and the, the second retransmission was some hundred or so characters shorter than the first. Um, we believe the first readable word in the message, Spruchnummer, message number in German, was shortened to Spruch NR. Uh, therefore, the first seven characters of the two messages are the same. But from that point onwards, in relation to the key, which is the same, the messages are then different from that point onwards, and that is a cryptographic depth. Um, and that's readable by this chap. Um, 11 days or so he took to read this. Um, 
by the by by dint of a whole load of modular two edition. Um, so it's just a bit of a slog, um, but he was able to to extract both versions of the message, uh, but more importantly, the four thousand or so characters of of key. Now, those characters would have looked pretty random. Um, I think one thing we can safely say about the Lorenz machine is quite an effective random letter generator. Um, but uh, there, there doesn't appear to be any predictability in certainly in the stretches I've looked at uh, from one letter character positions to the next. So that really isn't going to give us anything. Um, and in fact, that pertains the case because um, Tilton can't afford to spend any time on this at the time. Um, and the job then passes to this chap, Bill Tutt, who's a bit of a hero. And of course, unless anybody's been to Blakesley Park, we've probably never heard of him. Uh, 24 years old at the time he gets this job. He's been on the park since around January of 1941 and uh, fairly fresh out of training, cryptographic training. Um, so there are some techniques that are um, fresh in his mind. The job is given to him by Jerry Morgan, the uh, research section boss, um, phrased something like, see what you can make of this. It's uh, an adjective cipher. And so Bill Tutt's resolved to try and find the the patterns of the wheels, because it's a reasonable assumption that this is a wheel operated machine. Um, wheels have rotating patterns in them, um, which are not obvious in the letters. But uh, those letters are each formed by five bits. So um, Bill Tutt has then embarked upon saying, well, let's choose bit, bit position number one and start using a technique that plots them in tables, varying widths of tables. Something like this. Um, although I don't think Bill Tuck well, he might have envied the ability to use PowerPoint and uh, an Excel to produce these. His work is pictured in the museum in the Tunney Gallery. It's a bit more scrappy than this. So um, he's using this technique to plot, uh, as you can see, dots and crosses here, dots representing zeros or spaces in the text in the uh, data stream and crosses representing ones or marks in, tele in telegraphic language. So impulses for crosses and lack of impulse for dots. Um, and you can see we've chosen 41 uh, columns in the table here, um, which is ap appetite really. Um, Bill Tutts, he's got a decision to make now. How many columns is he going to start? Um, and in his memoir on this particular subject, he does mention, well, you know, where do I start with this? Um, and he took the figures 23 and 25, multiplied them together um, to give himself some form of start point. 575 columns. And what he's looking for is, is patterns, repeated patterns in there. This technique actually is not new to build, not a Bill Tut's time. We can date it, properly date it to 1863, when a paper was published by Friedrich Kaczynski, who's a German mathematician. Um, and he was trying to find period, the key, key length, key period in um, the vision air cipher, which is letter orientated substitution cipher. Um, uh, in other words, not really appropriate to this kind of uh, ciphering system at all, but. Well, hell, we're looking for repeats, so why not go for it? Um, but the question is that you know, if you're looking for repeated letters or phrases, then they're of limited length. Well, we've got ones and zeros here. There's no meaning implicit in those. So where do we start? Well, that's why I built touch chosen 575. Got to start somewhere. Uh, 575 revealed some intriguing looking repeats, but it looks like they were skewed. Um, so they, they were staggered when he drew this, his picture up. Um, so he repeated the whole process at 574, and uh, he found that the patterns he saw emerging were, in fact, in lining up. So implying an underlying repeating frequency of 574 characters, which is just far too long for a machine like this. Um, the implication is there might be a wheel in there, which has got 574 cam positions on it, which is just going to be too big and too unwieldy. Um, so the next step, I guess, if you're a cryptographer, would be to factorise it into its primes. Um, this is something I usually challenge the school kids when they're doing a, 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 a section on this, in particular in prime numbers. Um, 
and I asked them to uh, if they can factorize 574 into its primes, not expecting an answer. And on the three occasions now, over the last year or so, I've had students stuck their hand up and straight away told me 2, 7, and 41, which is quite remarkable. So my first question being, being a skeptic is you've been here before um, or you've heard this story before. And the answer is no, exclusively no. So there are some people who can seem to me innately be able to uh, factorize things. Um, but anyway, they were right. It's 2, 7, and 41. 2 and 7, we're going to discard, discard, discard because, well, 2 is by definition a prime, but it's even. It's going to do us no good in cryptography. 7 is far too small. Um, and engineering-wise, you wouldn't build a machine with only 7 start positions on it. It will be rotating much too fast, apart from anything else. 41 is in the sweet spot where we would expect it to be in a machine like this. And so if this is Bill Touch work plotted in in Excel and then put into the PowerPoint slide. And those of you that are, that are clued up on this will see straight away there are patterns in there. Mm, or will you? If you're sharp enough, you'll have found these. Uh, they kind of stand out when they're highlighted. This great big long repeat at the top here is repeated down here. And there's a green one and a blue one. And then they're on the match if you look hard enough. Um, the really important feature about them <clears throat> is they start and finish in the same columns. The red one, they're perfectly aligned. The green one perfectly aligned, the blue one perfectly aligned. Um, so this is pretty, pretty solid proof that there is an underlying repeat in bit position one, and its frequency is 41. 41 wheel positions or 41 character positions. So this is a start, but we know there's 12 wheels in this machine. So you have to repeat this, and I've I've not got round to that yet, but you need to trust me on this. If I repeat this at 43 columns, I should see these, these patterns. They'll have moved around the diagram, but they will all line up again. They don't line up, or they shouldn't line up at any other prime intervals, or any other intervals for that matter. Um, so from this activity, we can we can actually divine that so we've there are two wheels operating in the in the bit one position, and they are 41 and 43, and three months' work by Bill Tutt. Not solely by Bill Tutt, and he's um, he's freely admitted that he didn't do all this on, him, on his own because he's got the research section to help him once he's broken the back of this. And um, we can see 41, 43, and the, all the other 10, or the, the other code wheels, all 10 of them, the encrypting wheels, have been uh, built out. Um, and we can see the two non-primes, but relative primes there the K4 and the S3 wheel. So this is a schematic diagram without seeing it. The really important thing about this is this machine now has been reverse engineered without anybody from on the Allied side seeing it. Um, that's quite an achievement. Um, we've also been able to uh, divine the function of the two extra wheels, um, the so-called motors or M wheels, mu wheels. Um, and they are as you can see from this diagram, there's a logical and out and the output from these two wheels, if it's saying uh, if it's effectively a one or a mark or a cross, then the uh, S wheels will move. If it's not, they will stay stationary. So these are moving some of the time and not others other times. So, and if you set this in commas properly, then half the time the uh, S wheels will move and half the time they won't. Um, the, the K wheels move um, for every input character. So, and all five wheels in both groups of five move together. So they all move together. K is moving for every input character. The S is only moving when instructed to do so. Okay, so it's a complex um, machine. Um, and the numbers are really impressive. And of course, 61 times 37 is more than, you know, a factor of more than 2,000. Um, increasing the total number of potential settings so you'd look at this and say yeah this is complex um, that's got to be a good idea because the more complexity the more security obviously um, well we'll see so armed with that uh, schematic the post office research station at dolly seal is able to build our own version of lorentz and here it is and i'll just run this video hopefully i'll come across okay on the uh, on zoom it may not see there we go so this is Sheridan actually resetting the machine and and he will start to put some information through it you'll see if I pause it there this there's the K wheels represented 
by plugs and sockets. So the top row of plugs and sockets here is representing the status of the cams around the wheel. There are 41 sockets on the K, K1. And if a plug is in, it represents an active cam at that position. If a plug is out, it represents an inactive cam, in other words, a zero. So read this off as the bit pattern around that wheel. Um, there you'll see that the second row here for each of the wheels here, if I was able to go to the right end, you might see, well, you can see it on the K2 wheel here, there's a single plug in place. That's indicating the start position. And the lamps are lit above the start positions in all these on all 12 wheels. So let's run it on. Hmm. And you'll see eventually we'll get some keys going, some data going through the machine. Um, what we've got here, these green lights are actually showing the output from the Ks and the Ss. They weren't on the original. That's just to build, put our volunteers, a, 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 a put that modification in so you can see what's going on. And you can see the lights are moving, indicating the wheels are um moving for input characters. If you look very carefully, you'll find the Ks are moving all the time, but the size down here, they're only moving occasionally. In other words, when the mu wheels tell them to move. Okay, so that stuttering action is entirely deliberate. Okay. Moving on, if I can make this move on. Next slide, please. Right. So let's do a bit of math about this. <laughs> There are 513 sockets on that machine. Um, and our challenge is for any given message, we need to put all the right plugs in the right holes. Okay, so, well, thanks to Bill Tuck, we've now got a reverse engineered machine, but unfortunately we're not really anywhere near reading messages that have been encrypted on it. Um, it turns out the military teleprinter German has statistical features and a process that was developed by Alan Turing um, called differencing or deltering or differencing at one um, is he came up with this and it shows a statistical bias in a in effectively in a character stream or a bit stream by the process of deltering that is modulo two adding adjacent bits together. And if you get an excess of zeros at the output, you know you've got a bias, a statistical bias away from the random occurrence of ones and zeros in that in that data stream. Um, that's going to come in useful. The side wheels are stuttering. Okay, it turns out that, that actually creates a predictable non-random connection between the plain text and the side wheel output. But it only becomes visible when we look through the, the, the kind of delta telescope, if you like, at this machine. So I'm going to use some heavy analogies here. So really, the acid question here is at the bottom. Is it possible to eliminate the need to load plain text in order to find the settings of a Lorenz machine that produce the cipher text? Because without that, we're not going to be reading, reading messages. So that's our challenge. So some thoughts on the side wheels. That stuttering action is complex and deliberate, but is it a good idea? Well, is it a good idea? It turns out, no, it's not. And here's a reason why and this isn't phrased this way in the, in the various descriptions you'll read of this machine, but just conceptually, the idea of the fact that the psi wheels are sitting stationary um, for about half the time, and in fact, in some cases, for multiple character positions of the encrypted message, what they're doing is they're adding the same key. You can treat this, uh, the, um, the um, Lorenz machine as two different machines, if you like, the K wheel machine, the S wheel machine. Um, when the S's are the size of stationary, they're repeating the key for, for different incoming um, text, which has already been encrypted once. But it's effectively creating cryptographic depths, character by character. So actually, on the face of it, whilst it looks complex, it isn't a very good, very good idea. So a competent cryptanalyst should be able to broke, break out the effect of the um, S wheels, if only we can strip out the effect of the K wheels or Ks. And there are only 22 million possible start positions for the K wheels. So our problem size has come down from 16 million, million, million start positions to only 22 million. So here's an oxymoron coming. That's less impossible. So we're going to need to do better. Can we do better? Well, the answer is yeah, we can. 
So let's dive, let's dive back into some basics. <clears throat> Using the terminology that's used on the, uh, um, the, the Colossus computer itself, if we call Z the cipher text, P is our plain text, key, K is the, K is the key, and S is the S wheel characters, or K is the K characters, my my mistake, my my error. K is the K wheels, S is the S wheels. Um, our ciphertext is plain text plus the cryptographic effect of the Ks and the S wheels, and then modular to modular to add in. So exclusive or if you like. Um, what we can do is we can tie by the um, I can call it the Alan Turing delta operator to both sides of the equation, and we get equation one as I've labeled it here. Okay. Now then, it turns out we can exploit repeated characters in the original plain text and some other features of German, which I'll come to. We can actually rewrite this equation only concentrating on a pair of bits at a time. And for the example here, I've chosen bits one and two. Um, this actually enables us to be more certain of detecting the effect of double characters or, or repeated characters or repeated bits in bit positions one and two. So that means we can add two versions of equation one to each other and we get up with, with equation two. So Z1 and Z2 are bits one and two in the cipher text. And that equals the deltering effect of plain text one of the plain text one, plain text two plus the key one, so K1, K2, S1, S2. So this is all fairly logical. We end up with two equations. Okay. Let's look at the reason why this addition of two bit positions is significant. Well, it turns out that the probability that delta plane one plus delta plane two is zero turns out to be about 0 0.6 and sometimes even more. So a 60% probability that the uh, if we look across along a section of plain text, German plain text in particular, um, we'll find a 60% probability that Bits, the bit positions in one and two, the bits are the same. All four bits are the same in two adjacent character positions. Okay, that's largely caused by repeated characters. There are quite a lot of those in German. Uh, double E's, double R, double S, double T, for example. And bigram frequency as well. E and I and I and E, for example, they both share bits five, four and five. So these are pairs of letters, letters which have the same bits populated in the same positions. OK, there might be other language, this is a leader here, that have similar statistical skews. And if you examine the ITA2 alphabet, um, you'll show which repeated characters can be used. So these are the ones that have uh, a zero or one in the same position in adjacent characters. Biograms like JAQU, for example, have P1 and P2 set. Um, and as I mentioned before, P4 and P5 have e, uh, have the same bits in E and I or I and E, which are frequent biograms in both orders in German. Also, um, if we look at teleprinter traffic, every time you shift between um, letters and figures, it's preceded by a space. And this contributes to that 0.6 overall probability also. And <clears throat> double spaces, frequently used routinely in teleprinter German and repeated figure shifts and letter shifts. Bear in mind, we're on radio communications here. Um, if a figure or letter shift is lost in the transmission or garbled, um, so the letter count, the two sister, two machines stay in synchronism, but there's a garbled character. If that happened to be a shift character, let's go back to the shift character, then, um, the, the receiving printer will be in the wrong mode and it'll be printing letters when it should be printing figures and vice versa. So for that reason, it's routine practice for a teleprinter operator to hammer the figure or letter shift keys um, three, four, five, six times maybe. It's not an overhead on the trans on the printer because it's not printing, um, but it just ensures as much as you can that the, um, the uh, other machine, the receiving machine, is in the right mode and it's going to be printing the right sort of characters. OK, so this 0.6 probability is going to be quite important to us. So what we can say about this is that uh, if we recall that equation two right along the top there, stuttering S wheels, now I do have to read this because otherwise I'll miss bits out. Um, they move together or stay still half the time. So what we can say about that is guaranteed 
Delta S1 and S2 is guaranteed to be zero at least half the time, in other words, probability 0.5. But also, we can also say, well, yes, we do move. There's about a 0.5 probability that S1 and S2 will either both stay the same or both change. Um, it took me a while to understand this, but, you know, if you think about it long enough, you will get there. So S1 and S2, this, this term here, get my pointer on it, is zero when the wheels don't move. And it's about half the time when they do move. Um, therefore, this term is zero about 75% of the time. And that's derived from the probability here is 0.5 plus 0.5 times 0.5. Total probability of being zero, that term S1 and S2, of about 75 or 0.75, 75%. Okay. So combining now P1 and S1, P2 and S2, the probability that they're both there's that zero is therefore the probability that they're both zero plus the probability that they're both one. So we've got 0.75 times 0.6 is where my 0.6 plays in. And the inverse of the 0.75 and the inverse of the 0.6, and we get an, we get an, an eventual probability 0.55. And what we can say therefore is for a, about 55% of the time. It turns out the equation two is going to simplify to Z1 plus Z2 is K1 plus K2 in the delta forms of them. And magically, almost, the plain text has now been eliminated from, from, the, from the set of equations. So we don't need to know the plain text now. We're, we're in a zero knowledge situation. So we can find K1 and K2 um, if we can solve this equation enough times. It's got to be solved for every possible value of Z1 and Z2. OK, so but the neat thing about this is we've eliminated the need to know the plain text. OK, so let's summarize this. We've got cipher text. We know this probability feature of about 0.6 and sometimes more than that is there in military teleprinter German. We've got a complete description of a Lorenz machine. And that can be done in statistical terms, thanks to John Tiltman, Bill Tutt and the rest of the research section. We know that the side will stutter, which means this term here is not random. It's 0 0.55, 0, about 0 0.55 of the time. Um, so in general, this equation now, 55% of the time balances and the uh, and the and the, P, the, the uh, plain text element disappears. This is only true for the correct values of K1 and K2, of course. But the neat thing about that now is it gives us the ability to test all the possible K1 and K2 positions and find out which one of those satisfies this equation half the time or just a bit over half the time. Um, so that gives us the ability to test all the K1 and K2s for all the Z1 and Z2s. So it's not quite as simple as it looks. Because you might say, well, that's only 1,271 tests to do. That's a piece of cake. Give me a pencil and paper and I'll, I'll, I'll do it in half an hour. Uh, it's a bit more, the, the more realistic view is I've got to do those for 1271 for all possible Z1 and Z2 combinations. So if it's a thousand characters long, for example, I'm looking at more than one and a quarter million operations to do that. What I'm looking for is that equation to go um, to zero, somewhere between five and 25% above the random score. So the random score will be half the message length of 500, thereabouts, plus or minus a few, um, and then if I've hit the right value of K1 and K2, I should see that score jump. And that should jump. The count on zero should go to 525 or, or above or even above. Um, it, interestingly, I, I don't believe it can exceed 25%. If anyone can prove it can exceed 25% above random, I'll be interested to know. But I did a test on that, and I don't think it can go above 25% above random. Um, but that's just a thought, a thought experiment. So this is doable by hand if you've got enough bodies to throw at it, okay? But we're really going to need a machine to do this fast enough to be practical. Um, and that's where Colossus comes in. So I'll just, uh, sorry, my, my mistake again. That's where Heath Robinson comes in. Here's our rebuilt Keith Robinson running. Heath Robinson machine has two tapes. On the left-hand side is the message tape. On the right-hand side here is the key tape. Actually, it's effectively the output of the first five wheels. 
Um, these two tapes are kept in mechanical synchronization by using the sprocket holes along the length of the paper tape. You can see this brass axle here that's keeping the two tapes in perfect register. Uh, the output is these two counters. You can see it's, it's switching between the two. Uh, it's producing a count and counter B, and it will flip to counter A, and then it will flip back to counter B. And this flip occurs for every loop of the message tape. Um, now I'm going to loop that tape 1,271 times, and I hope this doesn't happen. Um, because the two tapes, if I'm running too fast, uh, almost guaranteed to split down the sprocket hole run. Um, and that's not good. That means you've got to load the tapes up again and start the run again. It's a real pain. Um, so that's the weakness of this machine. Its target speed is 2,000 characters per second. It does that. It's able to get up that fast by virtue of the fact it's reading the tape by, pro by projecting a light through the holes. Um, photo detecting the existence or non-existence of a hole. That's quite an advance for its time. You typically expect to read a tape of that, a five hole tape like that, about five characters a second or something like that. So 2000 characters a second is quite something. Um, so this has to be, uh, this is its major weakness. Um, the output device for, for the uh, Robinson machine um, is Paul Wren, a hapless Wren. Freeze it there. Counting the numbers on the output there. So she's got a for one, two, seven, one for the K1 and K2 positions. And that's what we're finding. She's got to sit there and in front of this machine and write down 1,271 numbers. One of those numbers, we hope, in the ideal world, it would be one of those numbers, is going to jump and going to show a jump above the random score of that 5 to 25% statistical bump we're looking for. Um, that will be associated with a revolution count. There's a little counter on this panel here. It's too small to see here, which is counting the revolutions. That re revolution count will point at an explicit K1 and K2 pair. Um, and that will be my candidates for K1 and K2 positions. So I can find those two wheel positions if I've got time and I've got the patience to keep loading tape onto this thing. Um, so a rough estimate to do this by hand for, let's say, a five or six thousand character long message will be around, I don't know, five to six weeks by hand. Um, that's man, man weeks. Um, but to do it on this machine, given the number of times you probably have to take the, replace the tape, at least 24 hours. And that's a radical improvement. I mean, it's weeks down to days, um, or if you're lucky hours. But there's room for improvement in, the, in, the, in that machine. This comes into service early in 1943, and it's in full 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 blown um, service by around June of 1943. Um, but its weakness is obvious: uh, it's, it's unreliability. It's not abandoned as a project. Um, it's improved over time, and in fact, it's modified to do some other work as well. Um, it's, it, Heath Robinson is his nickname. It became known as Robinson for short. And it was developed into a four-tape machine at one point. It's called Super Robinson. Uh, and it found other applications as well you know, later on in, in such um, functions as crib dragging, for example. So um, in spite of its weaknesses, it does prove, um, under Max Newman's auspices, who's in charge of automation of all these things, that this process can be automated. Um, it's got some clever logic in it. Um, I won't go in too much into the depths of that, but it's not logic levels in there as we would understand it these days in digital logic. Um, the ones and zeros are representing points. And those sine waves are combined in transformers. Um, and it gives you a kind of native modulo to addition, which is quite neat. Um, so it's flawed, but it's not proof. We've got, we've got, um, we're on the right track here. Um, and automation is the way to go. Um, so during January or during the early spring, let's say, of, of 1943, uh, Tommy Flowers given the opportunity to look at this. It's a familiar face on the site. And his idea is let's do away with that right hand tape. We've, we're under control of that. The key stream, we're under control of. Generate that electronically. You have no, no need then to uh, manually synchronize these two tapes or to mechanically synchronize them. Therefore, you should be able to run the message tape um, unencumbered pretty much any speed you care to i mean there are limits to it but um so you can run much faster and much more reliably and that's the idea of, uh, of what became colossus is born 
and by 19, by yeah, this Tommy, um, by late spring, yeah, Tom Clouds has got the official go ahead. Um, it's not outright, outright rejected his idea because his idea is, 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 is enumerates out to 1,500 or so vacuum tubes. And you can imagine some scepticism about whether that could, a possible machine could be made reliable at that, at that kind of scale. Um, bear in mind that uh, valve technology in any kind of scale was fairly unusual. Tommy Flower's um, world is somewhat different to that. Um, he's coming from a design that, um, ethic that's trying to, to at least strive for zero maintenance. Um, and the lifetime of his equipment, typical telephone exchange equipment, is 30 or 40 years. So um, he's a, he's, his environment is somewhat different to the uh, domestic situation that the people in charge have. <clears throat> so there is no great enthusiasm for Flower's idea to start with, but it's not outright rejected. Finally, though, he gets the green light, official green light by late spring, uh, by which time we know he's already begun work. Uh, his boss, Gordon Radley, is quite up for this. And in December, Tommy and his team produced a prototype, um, which they got working in Dollis Hill. The story goes that one of the messages they broke on it, they set the first 5K wheels in about 10 minutes. And that's quite an achievement. Um, I've seen written somewhere, in, uh, I'm not sure whose who's memoir it was, it might have been Tommy Flowers himself, that that was regarded as a bit of a fluke. It was a short message. Um, this being a statistical um, process, uh, short messages is akin to having a too small a sample size. You can't really trust the output of a sample a statistical um, analysis of a sample if it's too small. The analogy um, or the, the analogy here is that if a message is too short, it's unlikely to succumb to this um, statistical technique. So um, they got lucky. And that was a pretty good demonstration. That machine is the one that's celebrated for running its first program, or its first job. 5th of February 1944, which is the reason why Colossus is now celebrating its 80th anniversary. And here is our rebuilt Colossus, Mark II Colossus, in the position where number nine machines stood in wartime. Um, so the, the Mark II machine has got some enhancements over the Mark I. Um, it has one single tape reader, although there are two. Um, but you can keep the we can preload the next job so there's no downtime between jobs. That's the whole idea of this. Um, We've got a control panel here. We can alter its programming in a limited fashion. We would probably have to say it's semi-programmable. Um, the algorithm itself is set up on plugs and on uh, switches, plugs and sockets. Uh, although much much of the uh, speed-related uh, functions are hard coded into the hardware, so uh, that's not an, that's not a an unusual way of going about things if you want the speed these days. So. Um, <clears throat> here's a single take running and it will come up to speed I hope eventually it's running nominally at 5,000 characters per second um, there is the ability to run it a little faster uh, the risk is it will fly off at certain speed small pulley up here is, is, is quite a tight bend around there and there comes a point when Newton's first law of motion takes over and the paper just goes straight on. That's just shy of uh, 10,000 characters per second. So the safe speed to run these at is around 5,000, and that's what we keep ours running at. So here you can see the photocell array. We've cheated a little bit. We've got some photo detectors up here, photodiodes. Um, the original RCA photo cells are hen's teeth, and at this age they will be unreliable. So we have to make some compromises in the rebuild. Um, you can see the 1940s light switch there. That's actually correct. There's a genuine photograph of it. And that's got one of those in it. And there's typical output. So what we're doing here for the output is those switches you can see behind there are threshold switches. And they're able to set the threshold above which I want the count. That is the statistical count to provide me with a, a print out. I'm going to show some of the valves here. <clears throat> uh, there are 2,420 in total on the rebuild. Um, most of which are these red ones and they're grey equivalents, uh, simple RFAF pentodes, um, about 1,600 plus of those. Uh, this view at the back, I'll just pause it before it goes on. This area here is my electronic Lorenz machine. So every one of the cams or pins on a, on a wheel in the Lorenz machine is represented by one of these thyrotron tubes, gas-filled triodes. Um, so those of you who are quick on the count will point 
the fact there's only 490 of them on there and there should be 501. And in fact, the other 11 are around the other backside of the rack. That was a mistake I first made when I visited this machine. I counted them. I thought, they've got it wrong. It's 490. No, the other 11 are around the, around the other side. There's a good reason for that. Um, so that's my Lorenz machine, my electronic version of it, which can produce, as it's all 12 wheels, it can produce the full key, both, both the K and the S wheel components of the key. Um, and a bit of power distribution going on here. Eight and a half kilowatts this thing draws, so it gets warm in the, in the summer. It's quite comfortable in the winter, though. Okay. So that's the machine in its um, final form. Concluding, the one plus technique actually can be extended to four and five, and then you can solve for bit three. And if you want to try this for real, you can try it on Martin Gillow's, the esteemed Martin Gillow, um, his site, virtualclosses.co.uk. You can actually get to, to real runs on real messages there. Um, the output from passing the uh, from getting the first five wheels the k wheels that can be applied to the <clears throat> the bomb uh, so the um our tame version of the um lorenz machine sometimes called the tunny machine more appropriately a decoding machine um and that produces something called the dki the dki can then be attacked by crib dragging um <clears throat> And the crib dragging will be done using either a dedicated crib dragger like the Dragon Machine or indeed the uh, the later versions of um, the Robinson. Or indeed the Mark II can actually be used for full machine diagnosis. So it can be, if the, if the operator is allowed to or instructed to, they can continue and diagnose all 12 wheel positions. So this isn't going in guaranteed success. There's a whole load of attrition going on here. Quite a lot of it at the upfront at uh, message interception level. Um, there's a massive fall off rate there, and only a relative few messages are going to be suitable for processing uh, for machine processing on Colossus. Um, so that's disappointing in a way. Um, not every message will be read. Short ones, in particular, we know a thousand characters on, and, and, and fewer, unlikely to get a successful read. And I guess you'd only try those if you had no other work to do. The upside, though, is around 63 million characters of any enemy information was read. Now you can look at that as 21 Bibles. I like um, I like to to, to pitch that to uh, to visitors as like reading all seven Harry Potter novels 11 times over. That's quite an impressive amount of information. It's nowhere near the complete view, but you need to set that alongside all the intelligence we're gathering from Enigma, and in spite of being only a small window on the enemy operations bear in mind this is high grade enemy intelligence um, and it's stuff we wouldn't have had before okay we also know that of the 10 machines at petchy park two of them the uh, latterly called red and blue survived they were installed at the oakley site uh, in cheltenham the oakley site is now sainsbury supermarket so that's progress for you why were they kept well we kind of second guessed assumption was that they could be used during the Cold War, um, bearing in mind the uh, USSR coming from a slightly prickly ally during the Second World War into a full-blown Cold War enemy, if I can use that term. Um, would there be a Cold War application for this? Well, kind of. You, you can you can obviously see in a GDR situation, um, it would work well enough because that's German. There's German language. But what about other languages? So that's the... Uh, there's the acid question. Does it work for other languages? Indeed, does it work in Russian? So at that point, I'm going to hand over to Jerry. So Jerry, would you like to pick it up? Okay, so part two. This is a picture, a well-known picture of the uh, Colossus that Peter has just been describing, being operated by two Reds. But, and this is... A repeat of some of Peter's stuff. We we did determine that there were some uh, some details in my talk that actually were the same as in Peter's talk, but we decided not to worry about that. We can refer to it as reinforcement of the important details. So on the left we have a tele a teletype. You'll notice it's got German text on. Well, maybe you won't, but 
it has German text on the keys. So, for example, bottom left, we have a Ziffer, which is German for letters, so, sorry, numbers. And on the right, we have BU, which is uh, short for Buchstaben, which is German for the letters. On the right, we have, once again, our SZ42. Now, uh, unlike Enigma, where you have to have somebody standing and looking at the lights and writing them down and then giving them to the transmitter operator, it's a completely closed and automated system. So if the uh, sender wanted to just send a really, really dumb message like hello to the other end, then they would send, first of all, they would send an eight to ensure that the uh, receiving system was in letter shift mode. And then the actual text, H-E-L-L-O, and then carriage return and line feed. And I'll come to why they are 8 and 34 in a moment. And these would be encrypted to RMN59JXQ automatically. And the transmitter then automatically sends the message to the receiving end. And RMN59JXQ is received. And that converts back into H8 Hello 34. So it's a completely closed system, and nobody needs to know what the crypto text is in this system. <clears throat> now, we use uh, this as an explanation of the characters being used. Uh, you'll notice there are two rows at the top, letters and figures. Uh, the letters obviously contains the letters plus uh, a number of control characters, carriage return, line feed, the letter shift character itself, figures, space, and blank tape. And the figure shift contains the numbers and some punctuation, along with the same six control characters. Now, supposing I have this message, I've received this message, ex volle wir auch bleiben und and so on and so forth, and I want to decrypt it. And I would, uh, now given that I know what this message, message settings are, you have the, the five K wheels, the two motor wheels, and the five S wheels in a simulator of my own. Much as I'd love to be allowed to play with the uh, the Tani machine, and indeed the Colossus, that's obviously not going to be allowed, so I'm using a, a, my own simulator. And I, if I now encrypt that plain text, I end up with this text. At the beginning, you'll see four slash characters and a lowercase s. And at the end, you'll see a lowercase e and four more slash characters. And these mark the start and the end of the encrypted message. Now on Colossus, the start and the end are indicated by uh, special holes in the, in the crypto text tape. And you'll notice, if you see, look at the start hole, you'll first of all see it's not lined up with the um, rocket holes. And it's also not lined up with any of the holes in the first in the character marked as first character, so it's offset both in the sprocket from, from the sprocket holes and in the data holes. And at the other end, you see the same thing happens with the stop stop hole. It's also offset from the sprockets and also offset from the data, although it's in a different position. So in a sense, you have a you've managed to cram seven bits into this five-bit tape, although those two extra bits are only used for start and stop. And this is a picture of how, how it actually looks on the real tape. And when we have to make tapes, because they do break from time to time, we have to use this piece of machinery, which is, was left over from, uh, and as I understand it, from World War II, to actually punch the start and stop holes. And the idea is you would place the tape so that the little, uh, little uh, thing sticking up there goes through a sprocket hole, and then you would use a dibber 
to actually plug, uh, to actually punch the stop hole and start hole. So it's a completely manual process. No tape punches can do this for you. <clears throat> now, this is uh, my um, my own uh, Colossus, simu uh, my own SZ42 simulator. And you'll see the ex voller wir auch bleiben, and so on in this line here. Yeah. And the encrypted message J3KF5LXT slash 95 and so on and so forth on this line here. And I'm hoping you can see my mouse as I wave it around on my screen. As Peter mentioned, if you take all the possible um, wheel positions, you, you, are, you are multiplying together the number of positions of each of the wheels, <clears throat> excuse me, and you end up with 16 million, million, million possible start positions. And that you could, in theory, do it brute force, but in practice, you, you would need a much, much, much more powerful computer than would have been possible in those days. So we just do two wheels. Um, and you start with the K1 wheel and the K2 wheel, and that's uh, just 1,271 possible positions. I'm using K, M, and S for the wheel names in my simulator. Uh, but these are also known as Greek letters chi, mu, and psi. So here's my simulator. It's empty at the moment. I type the letter A, and it converts to Y. Type the letter A, and I get an O. A, and I get an H. A and I get an M, A and I get an R, A and I get a T. And lastly, in this little demo, A and I get a G. And interestingly, unlike Enigma, this machine can encrypt a character to the same character. So A could have been encrypted to A and so on. Now, if I just repeat that, and this is just to emphasize the, the stuttering that the uh, Lorentz machine does, if you look at the S1 to S5 wheels as I type, you'll see that they do not change each time I hit an A. So once again, A, and it didn't step. Then it does step for two steps. And then it's going to say stuck with S1 at 34, S2 at 38, and so on, for two or three more characters. So that, that demonstrates again the, the, the suttering, the motor wheels controlling five of the wheels and determining whether or not they step or don't step. And we now move on to this algorithm. The uh, one plus two equals dot, where one is an exclusive or, which I've also recently heard um, referred to as an exclusive disjunction, which is a rather fine expression, I felt. And I also wrote some software based on some software that Mr. Virtual Colossus or Martin uh, wrote it originally in Algol. I rewrote it in C, just so I could add my own uh, sort of display methodologies to it. And it comes back with the the uh, uh, the first the one the the, the 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 position that ends up with the highest value is actually start at five and and three. In fact, that's wrong. And it's the second result that's correct. Start is at 31 and start is at one for the two first tracks. This is a bit like false stops on the bomb, the, the standard demonstration on the bomb machine for the Veta 4 Hesaga crib has four stops of which only one is the correct one. Let's move to Russian now. This is a, a screen uh, a screenshot of a Russian teleprinter, which I borrowed from Wikipedia. You'll see that the characters have uh, the keys have rather more characters than in the German version, and that is because it can do both Latin and Russian Cyrillic. Each key has up to three characters on it. Top right to Z. Perfectly standard Latin Z. Bottom is a plus sign. Top left is a Cyrillic Z. 
So you have, as you can, if you look at the other keys, you'll see once again there are Cyrillic characters top left, Latin characters top right, and generally speaking, some special character like uh, down here, for example, there's colon and equals and question mark and so on. And this teletype actually has three shift keys. So on the left, we have one labeled one dot dot dot, and one dot 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 gives you the characters at the bottom of the keys. You have a dot dot dot, which works for the Latin characters. So if you've applied a dot dot dot, and you have the characters on the top right. And last but not least, definitely not least, to the right, to the total right, you have a key which is marked to what looks like PYC. But in fact, that is in Cyrillic. And those letters stand for RUS. So it's the first letters, first letter uh, of the word Ruski, as in Ruski Yazik, uh, Russian language. So, just to recap, if, if RYS is engaged, then you get the left top left character received. If A dot 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 is received, you get the Latin Z. And if one dot 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 is received, then you will interpret that as a plus. I've now added to the original uh, ITA2 coding, I've added the Russian characters as they are, as they appear on that teleprinter. So underneath A, the top row is still Latin. Underneath the Latin A, you have the Russian A. Underneath the Latin B, you have the Cyrillic B, and so on. Latin, Latin C has below it a character which is not a C, but in fact is a TS, a character that's transliterated as TS. Now, some of the characters, uh, Russian has more letters than uh, the standard 26 Latin letters. And what's happened here is that uh, looking at this um, table of letter frequencies, some letters uh, are very heavily used. So top left, you can see 8.04. And some letters are very, very, very much less used. And... The four I've currently highlighted are sh, sh, sh uh, backwards e, eh, and u, and they are shunted off onto the figure shift. There's a character here, which is known as the uh, hard sign, which is uh, the importance of which isn't actually doesn't really matter for this, but. The keyboard doesn't actually have that character on it because it's so rare, they haven't bothered to put, even put a key for it. Uh, as it happens, uh, in, the, in the sample plain text, which I'm going to uh, use to test my system, I've replaced the hard sign with an apostrophe, which is how Ukrainian Cyrillic works. There's a character there, ch. Now that appears on the four key, and I'm imagining that that must just be because it ha does bear some resemblance to the number four. So they put four and ch on the same uh, on the same key. So so far you can see four as a ch. Backwards e ch 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 and u are all on figure shift keys, uh, figure shift points on the keys. And there's one more character which is omitted as well, which is this e with a diuresis. Uh, in Russian. It's quite often, it's quite normal actually not to bother with the diuresis because you're just supposed to know if you're a fluent Russian speaker, whether it's supposed to be in a ye, which is the version without the diuresis, or a yo, which is the version with the diuresis. So it, uh, it appears, for example, in uh, the surnames of uh, Russian names. Uh, Khrushchev was an example whose name would formally be spelled with the E with the di diuresis, but normally it was just written, at least in English transliteration, as, as Khrushchev. So far, so good. You can see the bottom row contains 
yeah, ch, 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 u, and ch. Now, I, now I needed some some plain text to play with. Now, okay. in in our museum, we have a poster left over from a women in computing exhibition that we did a while back, and this is a poster for one Katarina Yushenko who wrote, amongst other things, a book called Adresnoye Programovania. As it happens, incidentally, this lady was uh, a Ukrainian, although she was a Soviet citizen at the time, and so she wrote in Russian. And this is the text, approximately 2,500 characters, which I uh, removed from the uh, introduction to the book. You'll notice there's both uppercase and lowercase, there's punctuation, uh, there's a, a bit of bolding here and there. So I had to convert this into something closer to what the teleprinter that I just showed you would do. So I wrote a little conversion program to convert from the uh, UTF to uh, a simpler font. And you end up with a text looking like this. You'll see there's seven for letters and nine for spaces and uh, other numbers which have been thrown in to control the control the shifts. And I then encrypt it. Once again, you'll see the four S's, the four slashes and the S and the E and the four slashes. And then I would throw it at the same software that I used to prove the German um, decryption. Sorry. Overshot slightly. And to start with, the one plus two algorithm gave me the same 31 and 01 as the two start positions for tracks one and two. I then started getting more enthusiastic and I decided to try tracks four and five. Now, this worked nicely on the German. It gave me the start positions of 15 and one on tracks four and five, but somewhat to my dis disappointment, for the Russian text, it was the 597th on the list of possible uh, uh, possible positions, the, the 15 and the one. So I worried about this for a while, and then I realized that when I looked at the German text, there, a lot, there was a lot of duplication in the, in the control character. So you've got two nines here are double spaces, and two fives, which are number shift, and two eights, which are the letter shift. So I thought, well, okay, two can play at this game. I will just throw in some randomly doubled uh, control characters. So where before, at the top left, I had seven W, nine, Kniga, nine, Ishlovin, nine, and so on. You can now see I've got 77s and 99s and 99s and 99s and so on. And that moved the start positions of 15 and 1 to the fifth or the sixth uh, possibility. So it's still within, uh, it's now within a reasonable um, uh, feasibility to try and determine what all the, all the rotor positions were. As Peter mentioned, there's some some interest in bigrams involved here, where characters are the same, or at least share some bits in certain tracks. Uh, in the original German message, there's a double T, as in the word Wetter, and also in the word Rottesdorf. German has a special character for the double S, uh, but the special character doesn't exist in ITA2. It's the character called S set, and it kind of looks like a bit like a Greek beta, but in this in this uh, system, they would have to, they would have to actually write the double S character as two S's. Not only pairs of identical letters appear, but also the likes of I E and E I, but only for certain tracks. In this case, tracks four and five. So if you look where I've uh, ringed E and I, you'll see that tracks four and five are both zero in both cases. So this is this is the German bigrams. Uh, 
clearly where two characters are equal, 99, then we're going to have uh, bigrams in every track possibility. And you also get quite a few bigrams in tracks four and five. In the, in the Russian text, you, you get uh, actually more, tr more track possibilities in tracks, uh, more bigram possibilities in tracks three and five. And then when I added the extra sevens and the extra nines and so on, you, you, you clearly get a, a lot of bigrams in all the possible tracks down for the dupl now introduced duplicated characters. Uh, other Russian projects. Well, I'm, this is slightly off the uh, off the main thread now. We also had another Russian project relatively recently to try and understand some of the works of Katerina Yushchenko, who earned a PhD in 1950 for computer programming. Basically, she wrote. She designed and wrote a book about a language which she called. Uh, Adresnoye program of Vanier, which is normally uh, abbreviated in English to APL, but this is not the APL, which uh, some of you may have heard of or indeed even used. She was part of a member of a team who developed the MESM uh, in Russian or MEOM in Ukrainian computer. And that's what I just said, address programming language, APL. Briefly mention, what's in a name? Uh, a Ukrainian name is Katarina, but on the book she writes because she's writing in Russian. She has an initial, a first initial of E, which is the Russian version of Katarina, which is Yekaterina. And she wrote uh, another book um, or co-authored another book, The Elementi Program of Vanya, which is, appears in translation in French, Hungarian, and German. And that's a, a copy of the uh, cover of the Elementi program of Anya. And a while ago, we gave a lecture concerning the contents of that book. And if anybody happens to want to uh, look at this work that we did, this is a program incidentally for uh, producing, uh, <laughs> calculating square roots which uh, I interpreted from the publication and wrote an, in, an interpreter for. And this is some examples of the square root program running. So here's the square root of two and here's the square root of three. But the point I'm trying to get to is that if I can get to the chat, I probably have to stop sharing now for the chat. Oh, no, it's up here, my mistake. If anybody wants to watch for free, gratis, and for nothing, a copy of that talk, which we gave some months ago, then you can, you can get it from there. And with that, I open the floor for question and answer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your attention to both of the talks. So I think the conclusion, Jen Jerry, is yes, it does work for Russian. Yes, it does work for Russian. Not <laughs> that, although I, I kind of hold the view that, you know, I'm sure if we ask GCHQ whether they actually use them for Russian, they would neither confirm nor deny the uh, possibility. <laughs> <laughs> well, the cat's out of the bag with the Ferris book anyway in 2020. So, so true, we've, yes. We've just underlined it, really. Um, just to, by way of saying how this how this kicked off, I can't remember whether it was a Zoom call or just a chat in the corridor. <laughs> but we got talking about this, and uh, I happened to I think I probably came up some flip comment like it'd be really great to know if this worked for Russian, wouldn't it? And Jerry responded with something like, "I'll be right back." <laughs> well, it did take a few weeks, but he was right back with it. So, <laughs> and here it is. Because some of this thinking we were doing, I was doing actually during the pandemic when there wasn't wasn't anywhere else to go anyway. Yeah. There you go. So. Do we have any questions? Yeah, we're all too dumbfounded, aren't we? 
<laughs> I can see one in. I can see there is a question in the chat, um, and it's what did what did the CCCP use? What did the USSR use? That's a very good question. I have no idea what they used, but um, well, well, obviously, uh, Lorenz is the same answer to that. But, uh, Peter, a, a, yeah. a question I get often asked that yeah. um, when I'm taking people around the Greek Museum is how many Lorenz machines were made. Hard to say. It, 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 in the low hundreds, I would estimate. Mm. Uh, it's not a commercial machine. Mm. Um, I always, I always say that there are. Uh, I think there are only four that we know of. Yeah. Um, two in, three in America, and one in Britain. No, two. The, our, our machines on loan from the Norwegian Army, isn't it? That's correct. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, our machine is not in working working order. It could be, and we have the talents and the skills to do to make it work. But of course, we don't actually own it, so we're we're not in, not gifted with the ability to do that, or the permission to do it. Um, we have got a working teleprinter, and uh, those who've been to the museum will be in, will have will have already realised that that we got lucky on eBay with that. We bought the thing for nine pounds fifty, actually for ten pounds because of no change. But well. it turns out to be an original. 1942, uh, Lorenz. Temptation is to get the uh, Lorenz machine working, encrypt messages on it, and then uh, run it through the Colossus machine, of course, and mm. set the set the uh, the decoding machine up and read it. Um, but going back to the numbers, um, they probably only needed low hundreds in, in anyway because um, they were most of the connections were duplex in that they were able to to have uh, bi-directional communications quite crudely by having two Lorenz machines, one for transmit, one for receive, receive at each node. Um, and the there was something like I think a maximum of somewhere around fifty um, node points on the on the network uh, when it was fully um, to its full extent. So that makes about a hundred, so to say, crudely, and then plus some spares. So, um, yeah, it, it is guesstimation, really. But as it wasn't commercial, uh, by contrast, the Siemens T fifty two was a commercial box of tricks, um, not routinely read, other than through through um, mistakes and depths. Although the Swedish uh, Code Cipher Bureau claimed to have routinely read Sturgeon or T fifty two traffic traffic. Personally, I've never seen any documentary evidence of that. Another thing, that, another thing that annoys me. Sorry to butt in. The other no, fine. Yes, yeah, is that some on some some of the curricula, um, the Colossus is attributed to Alan Turing, isn't it? Yeah, that's a, that's annoying. Mm, really frustrating, isn't it? That uh, yeah, we can't correct that curriculum error. Yeah, it's actually in the curriculum itself, in black and white, isn't it? And that's a yeah. that's a mistake. So I, I thought we might just go back to Mr. Davison's questions. Um, uh, I, uh, it's not clear if he means the Lorentz teleprinter or the Lorentz encryption machine. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah. Um, the machine that we have that was on loan from Norway was abandoned by the Germans when they evacuated Norway. And it may well be that there were other evacu uh, abandoned machines available to the Russians when, as suggested, they, they got to Berlin. Yeah. It's well documented um, that, that as the Russians moved uh, westwards, the, they they pretty much lifted and every piece of technology they had laid their hands on and shipped it back Moscow yes. direction. Vehicles, you name it, anything that was of any value, any intrinsic value. So it's n it wouldn't be surprising to know that <clears throat> um, that when the Allies, the Western Allies, got to Berlin, there was probably precious little left in the bunker and the Chancery. Mm. And a reasonable assumption that, that it has mostly been shipped back to Moscow, and that would have included those machines that hadn't, they hadn't had the opportunity to destroy. I mean, there was a standing order, as I, as I understand it, to to uh, when when the uh, uh, control point was abandoned, to uh, to put a pickaxe through the machine or, or destroy it some other way. Mm. Um, but then, you know, when when the panic sets in, you just got to get out of there, don't you? Yeah. So, and uh, TFB has asked um, how specific to that encryption system. So the Lorenz SZ42 and the Colossus are pretty specific to each other, I would say. Uh, it's an interesting question there. Is, is would GCHQ Colossus have needed adapting if the Russian machines were not Lorenz? Um, how specific were they? Well, that's a really good question. I think 
It leads me to actually do another speculation. Could the Lorenz machine have been made without actually altering its structure? Could it have been made more secure, inverted commas, more secure? So I'll, I'll, I'll go down that rat hole for a moment, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, it, 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 the, the failure, uh, to the, the way I like to visualise this is um, the statistical shape of the German language is reflected in the ciphertext, and it shouldn't be. It's a fundamental failing that there is an image, if you like, albeit reduced amplitude, image of the statistical shape in the ciphertext, not immediately viewable. It's like it's kind of, it's kind of almost it's out of focus. What you need is um, you need the, the built-up algorithm so that you can scan not the whole picture, but a, a fraction of the picture, um, build a and build it up stage by stage. So looking at a, a pair of bit positions in one go. So effectively, by churning through all the possible bit positions of the first, let's say the first two, which is all 1271, you're kind of like focusing a telescope. And at some point, the image will come into, into register. And hopefully that's at one discrete point, one value of K1 and K2. It very unlikely, won't very unlikely to be exactly that. It's a distribution we're looking at, and it won't always be a, a singularity. It will have some spread to it. Um, and sometimes the spread will be so flat you won't be able to know it to find anything, in which case more bets are off. So that that's the analogy I like to apply to this. It's a very crude analogy, but you're you're running a mathematical telescope over this. A statistical telescope and and at some point the image that shouldn't actually be there in the ciphertext comes into view and that points you to the settings that actually created that piece of ciphertext um so would you be able to stop that from happening well the reason it happens and the reason the statistics works the reason those uh, probabilities work is largely down to the stuttering effect uh, the predictable stuttering effect of these the s wheels so what would happen if you controlled or if you, you govern, you plugged up the M wheels so the S wheels moved every input per character just like the Ks do? Would that have been a more secure machine? Oh, I think it might be, personally. Hmm. Need to do some proof on this. But um, There's one for Martin if he's on. <laughs> no, he's not, I don't think. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, okay. um, well, that does. And that doesn't actually require any heavy duty re engineering. It's just a matter of Not flipping the tabs. You, you could just set the machine and leave it that way. Yes. So the, the S's and K's are moving all the time. To, to, to be really, really good, it would need to shuffle the bits as well. Shuffle the bits, move the second group of wheels with the S's. So somehow they were able to, to, to swap bit positions. And then you're looking at the design of a T52, the, the Sturdy machine. Mm. That's what that did. Um, so can I ask a question? Does that yeah. mean when they set up the Lorentz cipher um, um, switches on each of the wheels, they did Ooh. them 50-50? Yeah, the, uh, the, the the instructions I've seen, and I can't honestly remember where it is, where it was now. It might have been in a Cryptologia um, article. Um, you're trying to get the motor wheel output to be as 50-50, move, don't move, in the long run. But if they'd ignored that and made it so they weren't 50-50, well, it would make life more difficult, wouldn't it? it, it well, if it's 50, if it's biased one way or the other, it's going to it, it could prove 50, we assume it's 50-50, then that, that plays into our calculations. That's why the, the, the that directly comes up with the point six probability figure we, we I was talking about earlier. Do um, we have so, any evidence that they set it to 50-50? Are there's a documentation that said uh, what how, the rules for setting it up or how you sent the key? The rules that I've seen referred to, not the actual rules, are the bits, um, bit distributions on all the individual wheels should be, um, there should be 50% uh, dots, 50% crosses. Okay, you, you can't get exactly that because they're, they're mostly odd numbers all by one, one wheel, but as yeah. close to 50 50 ones and zeros. Yeah. But it's the bunching of them that, that's good, that, that's um, that's the weakness here. If you bunch the M ones, uh, the motor wheels up, so that you get a lot of most of, of the output is. You see, you could say, let's say it's a thousand character long message. You could abide by the rule and having um, five hundred stops and then five hundred moves, and that would be gift to us because that would be a very very long depth on the S wheels because they oh. simply wouldn't move. 
Mm. So the, the rules are rules are only as good as uh, the, the sense in which you apply them. Mm. Um, but you may, you may not have pointed out behind Jerry on the on the thing behind is the method yes. for setting up yes. from the key to the yes. settings on the Lorenz. Yeah, I refer to it as the Ablazer Tafel or I some something called a Spruch Tafel. Um but yeah, it's it's a setup. The sliders allow you to translate uh 26 letters of the alphabet uh to possibly 61 wheel positions, which of course you, you must find some way of doing that. Um the, the other thing to point out is that <clears throat> the uh where, where messages are in-depth and improvably in-depth, in other words, you can know for sure they've used the same key settings for two different messages, they're going to be routinely read. You don't need any machinery to do that, or maybe a crib dragger, but um, the, the the mechanics of it is pretty straightforward. And it's and it, that is documented that uh, quite what the volumes were, but we know that they kept the germs were, were, were repeatedly creating depth messages and depths all throughout the war and the problem with this with the key exchange mechanism they're using which is and the message indicator or and that was re replaced by a, a qep type system a shortened version but you still advertise that you're going to reuse a key and all the time you advertise you've messed it up uh, and if we're onto it and we and we re re realize that we're going to be routine routinely reading those messages so you don't need any of this elaborate uh, machinery to do that can you address um john t's question in the chat is it likely that after the war the machines were also used to check our own encoded text sent via teleprinter to see how easily they could be broken that's an interesting one i like that yeah that that implies that the machine uh <clears throat> that, that the analysis works on our own encryption encryption mechanism yeah i have zero knowledge about the the, the uh the the um machinery we were using what we do know is though it has the ability to check for the quality of key material and one of the potential uses for this and i've only i've only had um uh, anecdotal evidence of this is that colossus could have been used post-war to check the quality of key fill material so that will be on punch paper tape um and that is going to go to diplomatic legations around the around the globe for filling into crypto gear in the basement of foreign emb of our embassies in foreign countries, um, key material will be trans transmitted in or transferred in the diplomatic bag, and of course, in punch paper tape form, that's pretty much immune to X-ray probing. So um, it, it's a neat way of of, of of exchanging key material or sending it to our remote locations. Um, but but Colossus is well placed to check the quality, in other words, the randomness, if you like, of key material. So that's a potential use for it. So it's got all the mechanisms you want. It's got a whacking great tape reader, so you can get m literally miles of tape on there. Um, well, perhaps not miles, but a lot. Um, so... Uh, it, it, unlikely that we were using it to, to check our own quality, but I mean, I would think the learning from from this would be that we wouldn't adopt something that's routinely creating cryptographic depths like this is. Um, one of the kind of realizations to this is, uh, and this may be an in, uh, an incorrect assumption, but if you think about the engineer or the designer of the Lorenz machine. Um, He's almost deliberately designed the second part, the S wheels, to create cryptographic depths on a regular basis. Well, that's bonkers. Why would you do that? Well, you might do it because it makes the machine more complicated. And it certainly does that because the multiplying factor of the two S two M wheels is something over 2,000. So it all adds to that nice, big, impressive number um, that Sheridan, you assure me, is the right number of atoms in the universe. Unless you counted them differently, well, I'm I'm ignoring dark matter, which of course is no. an unknown. Quite so, yes, I think you've made that cra that caveat before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, was the traffic read from wireless only or combination wire? No, the, it was wire exclusively wireless. The, uh, the the interception operation started pretty much small time. Uh, the initial messages were received, I believe, on the Kent coast at Cape Lafern. And that's where they t they deem this, uh, be, having been used to Morse code transmissions, uh, in a wartime context, they started here in teleprinter communications, which they dubbed a new kind of music. And it was musical because the uh, the digital tones that were being used were 
were groups of three tones for a mark and three tones for a space. They were shifted in frequency. So it would have sounded like a slightly discordant musical tune playing. Um, Cable Firm wasn't really set up for uh, volume uh, transposition of messages, so um, it, it, it rapidly uh, shifted first to uh, Denmark Hill, southwest London. Uh, southwest London, yeah. Southeast. Um, southeast, is it? <laughs> yeah, I used to live there, actually. Yeah. Uh, so what, what, what I believe used to be the Metropolitan Police's nursing home, which, which when I was in when, when I was working was the Met Police's uh, tech support unit. And they had a very interesting setup up there, but that we were digressing. Um, so, and and not long after that, um, and certainly by the by late nineteen forty one, I think they'd started to move things under Harold Kenworthy's auspices out to Knockholt, just outside Seven Oaks, which is um, where I used to live. You see, indeed, and that started as a pretty small operation, but I believe it grew to something like about one hundred and sixty acres of aerials, whacking great aerial farm, something like eight hundred people working out there on a shift basis. And all they were doing was monitoring teleprinter traffic. So, um, but I think the art, going back to the question, I, I don't, I've not heard of any any uh, physical intercepts. Um, I think the Sturgeon, the T fifty two, was used for uh, for landline uh, c communications, but you know, they're, they're, it's unlikely we were ever not in the um, hot war uh, tapping landline communications, but it's certain that in the cold war we were um well yeah, in fact there there are various um, books been written about it so tunnels under berlin and uh, uh schoenfeld airport in particular as well i believe there was a setup down there interestingly a lot of that was run or some of that was run by the post office <laughs> which is kind of carrying the wartime ethic a little bit further into the into the more present uh, present times so um have a look down through the chat, see if there's any more. I think we've covered all the questions thus far. I was just going to mention that I have a copy of this book, Code Breakers. No, no, that doesn't work. Oh, okay. Background's taking over. Yeah, Code Breakers by, um, concerning uh, Arne Berling and the Swedish crypto program, yes. where, the, where the, amongst other things, they do comment that they were tapping wires hmm. because the, the, oh. the, the Germans were doing... Uh, Encoded, uh, encoding through wires, and it happened to go through Stockholm. Yeah, I mean that is the gentleman who claimed to be reading um, uh, T fifty two traffic on yes. a regular basis. Um, yes, and I can believe it if it were um, if it were depth. Um, in other words, you know, message in depth. Yeah, fine, but routinely, no mm, doubts on that. But maybe I'm doing me a disservice. And, uh, but let's, mm. let's see the evidence. Let's see the evidence of that first, and then, uh, mm. and then the change of view. Okay. Well, Mr. Davison has written again, saying he really must visit us again over being oh, since ten years. We're open Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays as a rule. Yeah. Sometimes extra days. Check our website. Yeah, it's the only place to see working bombs and a working classes rebuild. And let's not forget. <laughs> the most fabulous team of people that have the wealth of knowledge and experience and keep the machines al alive. Including the young lady who's just spoken. <laughs> I do not maintain the machines. I really Sorry, don't. I wasn't calling you a machine. No, no, that came yeah. up, didn't it? <laughs> no, thank you all so much for joining. I think it's been really, really great. And uh, yeah, we will be putting it onto our YouTube channel. So subscribe and follow. Okay, good. Okay. So shall I close the call? Thank, thank you very much to everybody. Yes, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the thank week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, bye, everyone.